Hello and welcome to Campus Stories. I'm your host, Joe Garris. With me today is Dr. Heather Pinson, Dean of the School of Communications. Thank you for joining me, Heather. Thanks, Joe. It's great to be here. So, Heather, although you're the Dean of the School of Communications, your doctorate is actually in music. Would, mm -hmm. would you like give us a little insight on how that ended up happening? Sure. Um, although I would love to be Dean, first of all, I'm just department head because my boss is the Dean and she, if she were to hear me, she would like to make that correction. So I'm just going to start there. But um, all my background is in music. So I play the violin. I grew up, I want to be a course, a diva on the symphony stage. And um, I wanted to play. Uh, I, it's, it's, so I, I kept up with all violin stuff. And then in college, I have um, surgery on my wrist. I have what's called Keenbox syndrome, which is where your bones don't grow the same length in your body. So my uh, uh, wrist bones and my uh, arms are kind of like this and so they had to cut off part of the bones to make them the same length. Long story short, I couldn't play the violin for my junior year in college. I was like, well crap, now what? Plan B. And so um, I would go to all these orchestra rehearsals and just sit there. So I had to find out something else and I started when I was old enough to go into the clubs I went to the clubs and learned how to play jazz music. So um, I was, it was in Birmingham, Alabama, a white woman who played the violin. So I fit in perfectly, uh, that, that's sarcasm. So uh, I had to learn how to play uh, old school and I played, I learned how to improvise and learn how to play uh, jazz and blues and from there country music. And I was in Louisiana, I moved later on. So of course I had to play Zydeco um, which is a fun dance music. And then up here, um, I learned bluegrass, which is what y'all do apparently up here in Appalachia. So I got my uh, keister handed to me in a bluegrass band with guys with beards down to here and moonshine in their back pocket. And they say, Heather, you ready to go? A one, two, a one, two, three. And I say, like, wait, 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 <laughs> wait. So they play so fast, and I had to learn on the fly. So up here, um, I have graciously adapted into as many different styles of music as I can. But uh, your question was in communication. How on earth did I get into communication? I ask myself that almost every day. My parents ask me that almost every time they talk to me on the phone. We spend all those violin lessons and all that money on what? And you're doing what? I'm like, yeah, mom. They have to say, like, where's the music school? I said, I don't know <laughs> where it is. But um, I oversee the humanities class, that dreaded Huma 1010, which you may have already had. Is that correct? I, I'm having, I have that right now. You have actually. it right now? Yeah. Really? Is it, so it's not dreaded if you no, have it right really, now. I actually really enjoy it. Good. Can I, who's your teacher? Uh, Lorenz. Carol Lorenz? Yes, okay, okay. So um, all of the folks that teach at class are artists, and Carol, in case you can't tell, is an actor. She is wonderful. She, she gets up on stage and she just, yeah, I know. She, she, she acts it to the class, and so everyone is a practitioner in their own right. From that, I've hired two puppeteers that teach on campus, and they're fantastic artists. I know, and now all the puppeteers hang out. The puppeteers know the fire breathers, so it's a great consortium for humanities. Anyhow, uh, I've worked my way up from coordinating humanities um, now as department head, and I'm spending much more time on spreadsheets than I am in the classroom. <laughs> so that's it for that question. And what brought you to Robert Morris exactly? That is also a good question. I just practiced how to apply for a job and Robert Morris had the mistake of answering my email and so I said well crap what do I do now and I googled how you know what to do at a phone interview where you're supposed to go ahead and get dressed up you know even they talk to you on the phone and um, then they brought me onto campus and um, all my research is on race theory, jazz, and blues, of course. I'm from the South. I call everybody sugar, baby, sweetheart. Antonio knows this, right Antonio? Well, wherever he is, he can accommodate on that in class because um, that's just part of my charm. So before the interview at Robert Morris, 
they thought I was African American and a woman. So I was a twofer, you know, for a hire here to come on campus. And this is common knowledge. And my boss at the time, Dr. Rex, Craw Rex Crawley, uh, who's also African American, thought that I was black. And that's why he pulled my name up to the top of the list. And I showed up for my interview. And I'm like, Heather Benson, nice to meet you. How are you doing? Hey, hey, don't forget to tip your waitress. Hey. <laughs> and he was like, Heather, nice to meet you. Wait, you're Heather? And she's white. What do we do? So um, we decided to go ahead with the interview anyway. And so I went throughout the entire day. This is all a very true story. And uh, I decided, you know, this was the place for me. Yeah. And thankfully, they did too. <laughs> Thank, yes. <laughs> well, we'll continue with Dr. Pinson after this break. These boys are my heroes. They come every week to spend time with my children. At Robert Morris University, every student is expected to reach out to others. They can teach them something no one else can. Wisconsin. Wisconsin. They're role models to the children, and homework comes way before sports. Their grades have improved, and their lives are just a bit richer. <laughs> What they do for my kids is truly wonderful. Change someone's life. It changes yours forever. Robert Morse University. I call them my lifeline. People don't realize how quickly you can end up on the street. One thing happens in your life, medical bills you can't pay, lose your job, and that's it. At Robert Morris University, every student is expected to reach out to others. We went to D.C. to work with the homeless. They sell a newspaper called Street Sets. Thought I'd help. This person came up to me and said, get a job. And for two hours, I felt what it was like to be homeless. Good morning. One dollar help. Some of the other students said, how can we change this? And I said, Sometimes you can't change the world, but you may be able to change one person's world. My dream, open a psych clinic for people on the street. Change someone's life. It changes yours forever. Robert Morris University. Welcome back to Campus Stories. So Heather, you've also published a book in the last four years entitled the Jazz Image, Seeing Music Through Herman Leonard's Photographs. Can you just give us an overview of what the book was about? Um, it was really interesting because I was in grad school and saw all of these beautiful photographs of musicians. When you're in the practice room, you spend a lot of time looking at pictures on the walls, right? And so I was like, wah, 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 and wandering around and seeing all of these you know, Miles Davis posters, John Coltrane posters, wah, 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 all the time. And so I would go to other music schools and see the same posters. I'm like, all right, well, who, where do these posters come from? Because this was like a really young Miles Davis. He was like in his late 20s or something. So I started um, investigating and found this curmudgeon-y old guy named Herman Leonard, who's from Allentown, Pennsylvania. Jewish cat, grew up here. Uh, he went to Ohio University, which again, close by, offered the first degree in photography. And then um, he moved to New York City and started photographing jazz musicians in the late 40s and early 50s, before these people were famous. So before Coltrane was famous, before Davis was well known, before Ella Fitzgerald was Ella Fitzgerald. And um, so he photographed them and then got a phone call from a young man at the time too, wanted to know if he would photograph women. And he said, what do you mean women? And the guy on the other, th other end of the phone said, well, my name's Hugh Hefner and I'm starting a magazine. 
so Herman said, well, if there's women, I'm interested. Uh, because he says his camera is all this, his way of introducing himself to other women. And he became the Playboy European, if you will, correspondent. <laughs> the European photographer for Playboy for years. And he w worked for, um, as a commercial photographer for Look and Life and Esquire. And he dropped the whole jazz thing because he went on to be a professional photographer until he picked it back up later in life. Um, and I met him and he promptly hung up the phone with me when I called him because I wanted to interview him and I wasn't famous and he, and I talked to him and he's the most bizarre guy and he's, he's, he's a, a brilliant photographer um, and he was an avid, because he's in California at the time in LA, pot smoker. So he would have his oxygen tank at 82 years old right next to his pot that he would light up. And I was like, wait, someone's gonna catch on fire and or explode here. Can we please put down <laughs> the paraphernalia? Let me do the interview and then you can get back to it. So as soon as we created this rapport, he liked me, we started talking and I developed this relationship with him and I wrote a book about him and his work on, on jazz photographs. So my book came out in 2010 in May, and about six weeks later, he passed away. But he called me before then and said um, uh, how proud he was of me. So that meant a lot to me. So that's all about the book. And you, I know you said you, part of the inspiration was when you saw the pictures, mm -hmm. wanted to know who took them, but why, why Herman? I'm, I mean, I'm sure there were other jazz photographers, but why him? That's a good question. There are always, you know, other, artist that can do the same thing. So with Herman, um, he can elevate a photograph really well. And it, he identified a style of music. So that became my passion as a musician to, how, to look at how a picture can represent a style. You know, when you see a picture of a banjo, you think bluegrass. And, and when you see an African-American man in a suit in a club, surrounded by smoke, you think jazz. You don't think blues. And so it's that composite that I was really interested in. Um, and Herman captured that. And as a photographer, he could photograph smoke, which is apparently really hard to do. So um, his commercial work is just as breathtaking as his work with jazz musicians. And you, you talked about some of the other magazines he worked with besides Playboy. He worked with, I think you said Esquire. Mm -hmm. um, and look and look life, and yeah, life. magazine, yeah. What were some other photographs of his in those magazines that were particularly? Remote? This is a good question. He's this one that really took off. He was at Ringling Brothers and Barlow Bailey Circus, and this was back in the day when there's like not as many like logistical problems of you getting up close, <laughs> I think, to the performers. Um, and so he was right up front, and he photographed an elephant that was coming around, and the elephant reared up. And the moment the elephant came down, you could see the woman riding on top of the elephant, it was Marilyn Monroe. So he photographed the elephant landing and with the trunk up in the air and Marilyn, you know, with her hands back too. And it's a gorgeous photograph. And that's one that is popularized. His work with fashion, um, he was a fashion photographer a while too. And so those have been published in those books. And no one's written on that yet. That may be a future work for me or someone else out there. If you were to write more on Herman, what else would you like, like with the fashion photography and all that, what else would you like to talk about with him? Um, about him. About him. Yeah, he, his personality, he made you feel like you were his best friend. And he had just photographed, come from um, a, a photography shoot for Sharon Stone when I had met him. And he's friends with Bill Clinton and Lenny Kravitz and him had just done, he had just done his album release cover. So... I am all in shock hanging out with this guy who's so famous and it's his personality. He would also only hire beautiful women. He would, if you were a very talented man, he was like, listen son, I understand that you would like to work here. It's just not gonna happen. And he, that, I'm like, that is so sexist, but he could get away with it. And I wanna talk about his personality because he just made you, everyone, uh, men and women, black, white, young, old, feel like you were his best friend. 
Well, that's, that's wonderful, Heather. We'll be right back with more after this break. Nicaragua is a completely different world. We were there to bring nursing care to some desperate people. At Robert Morris University, every student is expected to reach out to others. The very first person that I met was David. He kept saying, you have to come to my house and watch me play my trumpet. You could tell from the look on his face that it was just his most prized possession. I get back home, a few weeks later I got a message that a gang had broken into his house at night and they stole it, which was his life. So next trip back, we gave him a new one. The look on his face was just complete disbelief. He just absolutely couldn't believe it. And to be able to do something like that is one of the best moments of my life. He said he'd never forget us. Change someone's life. It changes yours forever. Robert Morris University. These boys are my heroes. They come every week to spend time with my children. At Robert Morris University, every student is expected to reach out to others. They can teach them something no one else can. Wisconsin. Wisconsin. They're role models to the children, and homework comes way before sports. Their grades have improved, and their lives are just a bit richer. <laughs> okay. What they do for my kids is truly wonderful. Change someone's life. It changes yours forever. Robert Morris University. I call them my lifeline. And we're back with Campus Stories. So Heather, you, besides teaching, you also play the violin, I'm correct, the violin, mm -hmm. in two musical groups. Well, violin and, and or fiddle, but it depends who's paying me. They can call it whatever they want to call it, as long as there's money on the table, that's fine. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, that's, well, can you tell us a little bit more about these groups where you play the violin and fiddle? Um, I play a lot, and, and that's kind of my out, my release, and I play every weekend somewhere. Uh, and I just can't always keep up with it. So I call the fellas. I'm like, where am I? Sp <laughs> just tell me where am I supposed to be? What time? Where? Who are you? And um, uh, there's a blues joint that I sit in on Thursday nights often. Um, it's called, it, yeah, you're going to get the picture as soon as you hear the title. Sloppy Joe's <laughs> is the name of this club. And it's a dive bar. I mean, your feet stick to the floor and you would rather go pee outside in the back than you would in the men's restroom. It's a dive bar. But uh, it's the best blues in the town, and um, it's got great, great music. So I'll go sit in with the house band there, but I play in a country band um, called the Fabulous Gunslingers. It's a very talented group. Um, the lead singer has a former Elvis impersonator. So he comes out with a hunk of, hunk of burning love and he gets on the table. He's hilarious. He's the best lead singer ever, ever, ever. And, um, uh, and so we do a lot of like classic rock and country tunes. Um, and then I'm in a Dave Matthews cover band, which um, it, truly that's where my heart is. Um, I'm the low man on the totem pole, which is hilarious because the lead singer is a surgeon. And I'm like, he has his hands insured. He's playing the guitar and his hand, you know, anything happens to him, like he's safe. So the surgeon, two mechanical engineers, uh, um, an appraiser of all these really expensive equipment. And I'm like, all right, you guys make more money than I do. <laughs> you buy the beer. <laughs> and the beer that they buy is like Bud Light. I'm like, really? Really? Can you please have some proper training on beer etiquette? However, I will not complain and take the free beer. And um, so, so that's, the, that's my Dave Matthews band. And we play a lot. In fact, we're playing at Wiggle Whiskey. Speaking of alcohol, <laughs> we're playing at Wiggle Whiskey, which is a new whiskey tasting over on, um, on the Strip. And it's, it's a duo that the lead singer and I do is like a Tim Reynolds, Dave Matthews duo. And then we're playing at Peter B's 
uh, November 1st. So this uh, sat a week from Saturday is Wiggle, because I just looked it up before coming over here. And then Peter B's is November the 1st. Um, and then my country band plays right down the street here at Sunny Gems on November, I can't remember, 16th. So I, I can, as you said, these those are just two groups. Have you, you've played in more groups. Is, uh, I want to talk about any of your other groups you've played in that you particularly enjoy being part of. Jazz is my heart. I love playing jazz. It also kicks my keister all over the place, so you notice that. And um, uh, I played in a band um, that, uh, there's a fusion band called The Weather Report, and when I was in New Orleans playing jazz, I, was, I started my own funk band called The Heather Report, because again, I thought it was funny. And uh, there's this one guy that comes up at one, and, um, in New Orleans, he comes up to us after we finish playing, and the lead singer there was this great singer. We do all, all funk covers, and he said, listen, you in that band? I said, yeah, this is our band. What, what, what is it? It's a funk band? I said, yeah, it's a funk band. He said, you know, honey, funk, it's a smell, not a sound. I was so caught off guard by what on earth does he mean? I thought it was brilliant. So I'm like, okay, this is philosophy at 2 a.m. in the morning in this, you know, deadbeat bar. I was like, wow, I just got hammered with like Buddha telling me it's a smell, not a sound. So he corrected me in that it's a, I guess, no longer a funk band. But anyhow, so I play jazz, I play blues, I play in the symphony, of course, for a long time too. Um, I couldn't play here in this symphony because they're really talented and they um, are like professional. I am happy to be an amateur. So that's what I do. And besides the violin, what other instruments have you learned to play over the years? I can't. I can play the viola badly. It's like playing a boat. I mean, it's, it's very awkward. It's giant. And, and I mean, the poor violist in the symphony, you have to play an alto clef. So I have to transpose. And then they're like, and they get all the bad jokes for the symphony because no one can hear them. I'm like, yeah, they're playing this really big instrument. And we're like, what's the definition of perfect pitch? Well, properly throwing a viola into the trash can without hitting the rim. So we all um, give the violas a hard time. So going back to this, violin is your favorite instrument. When, ha when did you start learning to play the violin? I was, I'd started piano and quit, ballet and quit, and then tap and quit. And so I started violin and my parents were like, uh-uh. <laughs> like you're sticking with this. And I was reading, I was about six, so I was six or seven, so I was late in the professional world. And so um, I was reading Sherlock Holmes or, and watching the TV show with Jeremy Brett, and he played the violin. So then I stuck with it because I wanted to be a detective like Sherlock Holmes. And he would play the violin, I would have a little magnifying glass and search for clues in the house. For what? I don't know. Like the misting pasta sauce that was actually in the back of the refrigerator. You know, and I was looking for clues and then go around and playing the violin. So that was how I stuck with it. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll be right back with more after this break. G morning, sunshine. Wakey, text me. Are your parents home later? We can hang. LUV, love you. JK. Holla back. Holla back. Holla back. <laughs> Are you with your friends? That's lame. We're in a huge fight right now. XO. What did you dream about? Something I did. Are you on your way to the mall? I'm lonely. Nude pics. Send me some. Text me. I'm starving. What's for breakfast? Guten Tag! Your Highness, Ross! I bring you arts enriched raisin brahms, fortified with increased test scores and creative problem solving skills. It's good! And good for you. Bobby? Susie? Don't worry, that's just the power of the art! <laughs> Feed your kids the arts. For 10 simple ways to learn how, visit AmericansForTheArts.org. Everything about buying a bigger place, 
Just waiting for a visit from the credit fairy. There is no credit fairy. How else will I get a better credit score? Look, you keep your credit card balances low and only open a new card if you really need it. No fairy? There's no magic to improving your credit, but there's help, and it's free. Go to creditfairy.org. Yes, ready, ready. Oh, come on, Randy. Animal shelter, here I come. And no, I'm not crazy or emotionally damaged. That's a stereotype. I just belong to a total loser. I'm a good dog. So if you want a pet, adopt. And if you see Randy, tell him he dropped his wallet. She goes to you. Welcome back to Campus Stories. So going back to the subject of your PhD in music, what was the transition like coming from musician to to academic life? It was awkward to say the least because again, I wanted to be symphonic diva. And the lifestyle of an academic, which I thought, that's what I like too. I like being around people. I like talking with people. Little did I know that academia has very little to do with people. You are locked away in an ivory tower for hours and hours and hours doing research and or writing reports, grant writing, lesson plans, and you only get to see people for that three hours a week in the classroom where I'm like, oh, finally. So um, it's all pent up because I've been like, you know, on the computer for so long and the poor students in the classroom, bless their hearts, they are, you know, overwhelmed because I have so much energy because I'm just, you know, tired of talking about teaching. I want to actually get into teaching. So um, I, I applied for this position as explained earlier and got it and learned how to be an academic because they don't really teach you that. I've never had one pedagogy class um, or more importantly, one business class. I wish I would have had a business class of some kind so I could learn how to better monitor a business because working in a university, it is a business and you have to learn how to uh, promote it uh, through publications and you have to learn how to sell it and you have to learn how to grant, write, and fundraise. And that's a big part of teaching. And how would you say your previous experience helps any st helps the students that might be interested in either might be interested in a career in music. Um, well, the business class is pretty important. Um, at Robert Morris, we're growing music a lot, and the marching band uh, from all of our different ensembles with the choirs first started out with eight students two years ago. Now we're up to forty. So we have a lot of students involved in music here on campus. So they're welcome to come talk to me and we can come up with a game plan. Okay, well thank you for coming on the show today, Heather. It was a pleasure to have you. Awesome being here, thank you. And that is all the time we have today for Campus Stories. Please tune in next week for more.